you start something new and you may want to say, I don't know if I want to do it. I'd like to stay in my lane. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with staying in your lane. It's conservative. Or you want to go out and do something new and you want, you're ready to just dive in. So that's taking a risk. And when you do that, who knows what can happen? It's really incumbent on the business person to say, okay, now that I'm going into this risk, I'm going to stray outside my lane. What do I not know? That's hard. That's risky. The business owner, it's no one else gonna, is going to do this for him, has to say, I'm going to look into what I don't know so that I can reduce my risk. The expressions that I get from people when I talk about this is their eyebrows are raised, like, oh yeah, Dave, like, how are you going to figure that one out? Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, a strategic financial advisor with over 40 years of experience in the field who's been able to save companies bucket loads of money. One in particular that we're going to dive into where he was able to find and help them to recoup a quarter of a million dollars, one company alone. So today, what we're going to dive into is we're going to talk about the truth about cash and cash flow looking into the future. We're going to talk about debt. We're going to talk about the importance of taking risks and a few other things as well. So please welcome to the podcast, Dave Groomer. Hi, thank you very much, Matt. I it's, appreciate your your opportunity that you're giving me here. Absolutely. Well, we're, we're blessed to be able to have you on the show. I mean, we're here to serve those who are looking at it, that are in the aspirational phase of starting their business, they have the idea, they're not sure where to go. And then additionally, the people that are already in business that are looking to make their next move, what kind of investments they should make, how should they be thinking about their money. And when it comes to talking about money, this can become a very touchy topic. So I'm super excited that you're here and able to kind of dive into the nitty gritty here with us. Great. Me as well. If you wouldn't mind, just give a, I gave a little bit brief background, but if you wouldn't mind just kind of diving into you know, your professional background, who you help, who you serve, and those kinds of things. That's great. Thank you. I have spent the bulk of my career as an auditor in a national CPA firm. I've worked closely with my clients in all kinds of businesses. Uh, and that includes professional service organizations, which is an area that I specialize in. Presently, I'm an outsourced CFO, which provides strategic financial advice to businesses, and I enjoy serving them. I love that position, an outsourced CFO. I've heard this in recent years when it comes to human resource management, where there's companies kind of built around mm -hmm. this. I think Bamboo might be one, something like that, where they you can basically just outsource your HR, have them kind of do the, the things that are required, but you don't have to bring somebody in full time. So it creates a lot of flexibility and increased uh you know, optimization of funds inside of the business. So how smart is it to outsource a CFO? It does sound a little dangerous, like just in the sense of like, shouldn't we have a CFO as part of our C-suite? So what is the kind of value that you look to add when you're going into a business? Or I guess maybe better phrased, at what stage does a business reach out and go, Dave, <laughs> we, we need your help? Well, there are, uh, there are two kinds of situations that, that I think about the most. And one is that a uh, businessman who's working 24-7 and he's marketing, selling, producing, delivering, and he's got a small back office, maybe three or four people or, or up to 10 people, and he's just so busy that he doesn't have time to think about the details. He should have questions for his office about, are we going to be able to meet the payroll in, in the upcoming weeks? Got enough money to pay the rent? How do things look like going forward? I'm thinking about a new, a new line of business or a new product to deliver. So what kind of investment should I think about having ready to make, being ready to make? And if, do I need a line of credit? Is the financial house in order? And somebody needs to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, sometimes it feels like a conversation that we like to skirt around or avoid and just – that's kind of. the easy thing to do. <laughs> if I have, that's the general rule of thumb, right? The more we avoid our problems, the more likely they are to go away. Yes. <laughs> so that, that's one person who should be talking to an outsourced CFO. The, the second person that I like to think about is that he thinks everything is great. He's, he's doing well, doesn't quite have the, the attention to the detail that he should have, and he doesn't realize what he doesn't know. Trusted advisors are very good for him, for he or her, because they can probe, they, they have the, the permission 
They're granted the authority to ask questions because even though it may not be their line of business, a lawyer can still ask about things that, that make sense. Are you ready for this? Do you know what you have to do? So I'm, I'm thinking of the song from The Grateful Dead, When Life is on Easy Street, There is Danger at Your Door. I love that song for those words. It's perfect, especially for this situation, but generally in life. Man. Yeah. I'm grateful Dead, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to go into this concept that you talk about, which is knowing what you don't know or, or seeking out to understand that which you don't know. Could you dive into this kind of idea and the background behind this, this thought? Sure. I'll, I'll start with the lesson that we learn and then go into an example. Okay. You start something new and you should, you may want to say, I don't know if I want to do it. I'd like to stay in my lane. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with staying in your lane. It's conservative. Or you want to go out and do something new and you want, you're ready to just dive in. So that's taking a risk. And when you do that, who knows what can happen? It's really incumbent on the business person to say, okay, now that I'm going into this risk, I'm going to stray outside my lane. What do I not know? That's hard. That's risky. So we tr the business owner, it's no one else gonna, is going to do this for him, has to say, I'm going to look into what I don't know so that I can reduce my risk. The expressions that I get from people when I talk about this is their eyebrows are raised, like, oh, yeah, Dave, like, how are you going to figure that one out? And the answer is you do need to look around, have friendly competitors, talk about what, what you're about to do, see what they've had experience. If you go to a bidders conference, ask about problems that were encountered by prior people who were offering proposals or anything you can, but try. Can't get it all, but just try. Now, that's really important. We get a sense of comfort by operating in a space that is familiar to us, which I think, again, is what we were talking about before. People want to avoid the financial conversations because it feels like it can be tricky or complicated. And so it's like, okay, mm -hmm. as long as we're generating revenue and we're pushing forward and the numbers look like they're bigger than they were before, then okay, then I'm just not going to worry about what's yeah. going on there. Yeah. That can be a problem. So I promise you an example. Yes. So let's talk about an example. Uh, one time I went to see a food production facility out in Westchester. And I had a simple task. I was preparing for a sales tax exam. And I started looking through invoices just to see if there were bills that we should have paid sales tax on that we were required to pay sales tax, but we didn't pay. It can happen. So I find a bill for cooling equipment. No sales tax. Interesting. Call up the, the vendor, speak to the accounts receivable clerk, and I say, we need a bill that has a sales tax because sales tax people, they assess based on a sample, and error results in a large assessment. We don't want that. So she says, she hesitates, and she says, okay, I could do that. I keep looking, and I find a second payment to that SERP from that vendor. And I kind of have a hunch as to what's going on because I wasn't aware of any second purchase. And so I called back the accounts receivable clerk and I say, by the way, could you do us a favor and refund the duplicate payment? And she says, okay, sure, we'll do that. Oh. She was kind of apparently waiting for me to ask that question to start with. <laughs> uh, Are they going to ask for this money back? <laughs> we'll, wh why do I see two payments for one invoice? Right. I just don't know. So I speak with the client and I say, look at just what just happened. Why did this happen? We need to find out, and we should look for more of these things. And what turned out was that the client was renovating the building that they were in. They had taken the responsibility to pay all the contractors and vendors on their own. The accounts payable people were not anticipating or trained for the sudden rush of invoices that they weren't familiar with. They were accustomed to easily taking the, the receiving report or, and the, uh, the purchase order and the invoice, making an invoice payment package. If they ever had a problem, they could call down to the guy in the warehouse who did all the purchasing, problem solved, easy flow. These invoices were a different animal. They weren't sure what to do, and they were overwhelmed with the, with the paperwork. The message here, consistent with my lesson learned, is that when you're going to start a new activity, get familiar with what's going to happen here, what could we have done? Spoken to other people who know what's gonna, what to expect when you renovate your building. 
had a large find. We, we came up with about $250,000 of duplicate payments, got the money back, a nice day's work. Ooh, man, the feeling that you have as the accounts payable <laughs> from that organization, like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I wouldn't worry about the accounts payable. It was really more the, the person responsible for supervising the accounts Correct. payable. Correct. Who had to speak about that. So one of the things that comes to mind with this as well, when, if we're thinking about the things that a business owner can do or consider in these kinds of situations, especially when they're embarking upon something that's non-standardized like a building renovation. You're not in the business of renovating buildings. You're in the business of whatever your business is, selling, yeah. selling widgets, selling mm -hmm. services, whatever it is. And so going into that, being having the wherewithal that this is something new. Like this isn't something that we nor that our team normally handles. And so even just doing a check-in with the team to see how do you guys feel about this? You know, like we're getting ready to do something very different is do you feel like this is something that you can handle? And then that goes into organizational culture because if you have a culture where people are afraid of you as the business owner, then they might just be like, yeah, of course, of course we can handle it. Like we'll handle anything. It'll be great. True. You know? True. And so if you have to, there also comes in an awareness of yourself as the business owner, as the leader of the organization as to how are you skewing the responses? How can you get a authentic response back? Excellent point. You really want to encourage questions and, and ask people to, to really think along the lines of as, as if they were the owners of the business. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. If this is your business and it's on the run, that's like a really good prompt for a question for, for those. I like that a lot. That's, that's a keeper right there. Yeah. That's a great story. I can't believe $250,000 in duplicate payments Yeah, out of control. The next thing that you talk about is understanding the project budget. And specifically, I know that you, you break outside of not just for construction jobs. And so could you dive into kind of project management or at least project budgeting? Yes, yes. It's a very valuable tool. At a minimum, think about it for a communication within an organization. Very valuable for assessing what kind of situations are popping up that we didn't expect. And the production budget, that was a tool that our company client put together to find those duplicate payments. It was so easy. It was unbelievable. I have seen situations where you could, you could walk into a film producer's office, an executive in the in the movie industry and they will have charts and excel spreadsheets printed out on their wall listing all the costs that they have every day and that's how they know the cost of a delay in production for one day wow. you can really go into detail so i like to tell people it's not just for construction only an example of ice that i saw where a production budget would have been useful at a minimum for communication purposes was a meeting that I attended after an audit where I sat down with a service client, services industry, and what they were doing was looking at the financial statements that we had just audited, and then they were, on the agenda also was a presentation of current year's operations year to date. And I discussed the financial statements. Then the CFO presented his financial uh, interim financial report showing budget compared to actual. And there were, the operations were broken down into two components. One was for regular recurring operations, and the other was for a very special industry event that they put on on their own at the end of the year for the industry. And they considered this a real moneymaker. That was the word that they used. So early in the year, nothing had really happened, and the owner, who's representative of a private equity firm, asks a question of the CFO. How is it possible we've done nothing? Last year, year to date, you were showing that we were profitable. This month, I said last year, last month, this month, we're showing that we're not profitable. We're not even started. What happened? How could that be? There was quiet in the room. The CFO, followed by the CEO, were a little bit tense because they didn't have a good explanation for this. So I suggested uh, that why don't, after this meeting, the CFO and the CEO retire and put together their project budget and do this on a monthly basis so that they could speak clearly about what the, what the status is. The risk that they faced was that in the back of his mind, the private equity owner was asking, 
could these guys be putting operational expenses into the moneymaker category so that I'm not getting a clear picture? Mm. And the communication wasn't good. No transparency. So the CEO and the CFO were kind of risking their trust that the, that the private equity owner had in them, as well as showing that they had the ability to, to maximize the, the profits of this, of this project going forward. Yeah, communication is, is absolutely critical. And it, establishing baselines and routines and, and those monthly coordinations of exactly what needs to be handled, it's when you look at it from the outside perspective, you say, of course, but when you're actually in the business and you're operating, there's so many things that come up and draw your attention and that pull you away from those kind of routines. And so yeah. establishing them early definitely makes sense. Early and consistent. Early and consistent, 100%. I think this flows nicely into uh, our next topic, thinking about thinking forward about cash flow. And so... Talk to us about that. Talk to us about cash flow and how does somebody think forward about this? What are the implications there? Well, the simple tools are to sit down and put together your estimates of when you're going to pay cash, uh, cash expenditures and when you're going to collect your revenues. That all varies. Two big items that, are freq- that follow a very frequent pattern are payroll and rent. Mm-hmm or bank debt service payments, you wouldn't want to mess around with those because as soon as you do, there are people knocking on your door. Yeah, 100%. We don't want that. Yeah, so so it's about planning for making sure that the money is in the right place at the right time. You do what you can, mm-hmm. and sometimes it isn't. That's why God invented lines, lines of credit. <laughs> okay, so I had a situation where I served as treasurer of a not-for-profit organization in Brooklyn. That was the first thing I really wanted to do. The problem with the prior uh, administration that, I, that we followed was that their idea of a budget was, well, let's take last year's budget and increase it by 5%. That ought to do. But what, what that tells me is that the organization probably hasn't kept their books and records up to date on a timely basis. They don't really know if the numbers are coming out even during the year that they have the base assessment or the base budget. They may not even be sure if they if it's the right budget. When I took over as treasurer, I pretty quickly got to work on figuring all these things out. I followed the collection patterns. I followed the expenditure patterns. Thank God, a lot of it was payroll because then it followed a regular a regular mm-hmm. pattern. I spoke to people about uh, new people, not new people. I spoke about new events that our organization was putting on. And I also looked at the track results of old events that were being put on before, that had been put on, and that will be put on again. And I got the information I needed. What I found was that it looked like we were heading for a loss for the year of about $100,000. We had time to deal with that, and we did. The most concerning thing that I found was that typically we hit our low cash points between January and March of every fiscal year. It follows the way the revenues were coming in because a large amount of revenues would come in in December for tax purposes. And also at an earlier point, because we had a fiscal year cutoff, those funds, a lot of it came in beforehand to cover organizational events. And so by the time February would come around, boom, we bottomed out. Unfortunately, what I found was that we were going to go negative in that period. That was a concern. Since we had a few months to adapt, we did. I discussed this with the president. We discussed it with the executive committee. We deferred some expenses. We canceled others. Some volunteers were not pleased, but we got a lot of cooperation. And we avoided the pitfalls of running out of money in February. We cut the losses down about 80% from where I thought we were heading to, uh, to where we actually ended up. So thinking about your cash flow is critical. You just don't want to be blindsided when it's avoidable. And that's a risk that you run by not diving into the details in the financial planning aspect, like you were talking about the predecessor's work that you fell in on. Right. Wasn't really thoughtfully conducted to understand when these went by specifically the pattern recognition. Right. And just understanding when these things are going right. to happen. Now the business owner is probably as long as he been, has been paying his bills for the last year without any, any problem, he'll probably think I can keep doing that. 
but you just never know. You don't know if you're prepared or not prepared for a sudden decline or a need for emergency funds. So it's good to question, am I okay? Things feel great. And if you wouldn't mind, just dive into a little bit about uh, lines of credit. Uh, who is it good for? When is it good? How, do, how should people think about it? First of all, having a line of credit is easiest when you don't need it. When you come to a bank and say, I really need it right now, boy, are there going to be questions. Um, for those organizations that can show they have regular seasonal patterns that banks can understand and you can lay it all out, things are a little easier. If you're an organization where your revenues are unpredictable, a little harder, but you can still do it, uh, and the bank can, uh, can ask for some ways to get assurance that they're going to be paid off. But it's about, since we know that the bank is going to be asking the same question, how will I get paid back, you need to have forward-looking information. Absolutely, and that goes into that, that planning. And the, I know that's something that we work a lot with clients here about is in their business plans and working on their projections and being able to make those more – as realistic as possible, based especially on seasonality of business and when are the ebbs and flows, when are you selling the most, when is when are the slow seasons and those kinds of things. Excellent point. As realistic as possible. One can come up with all kinds of numbers. And they do. I know from and they experience. Do. <laughs> and they, <laughs> they do. do. Yeah, there's there it's easy. Again, it goes to the same thing. A lot of people come in, they make their projections and it looks very similar to the way that you described the budget that you were working with where there's just a incremental increase month over month. So we're growing 7%, we're growing 10%, and you just see the straight line growth pattern for the next three years. And there are no assumptions to back it up to say, like, we have these projected deals. We're already in communication with these people. Out of these 10, we're looking at closing about three, which leads to this amount, which – fuels and backs up that number. They're like, no, 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 they're just going to grow. It's going to be great. You're <laughs> absolutely right. And, and professional standards, if an accountant is involved with them, require generally that the assumptions be disclosed. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a requirement when we're working with people, when the SBDC at, uh, here are working with people to go through their projections and everything. It's, that's a non-negotiable you're going to have assumptions. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to because I mean it's not like it's not like it's our standard, it's the lending standard. Yeah. So if you want the money, we know what they want, we know what the bankers want, so let's give them what they want. Right. The the banker is going to ask, "How the heck did you come up with these numbers?" <laughs> that's exactly right. Let's get that over that's with exactly. and tell them right yes. away. Yes. Yes. Yep. And that's something that people can find themselves avoiding when it comes to the business plan. They're like kind of skirt around the financial side, which again is why I'm grateful you're here. Yeah. And, and then just to point out the second question, once the bank now knows, how did you come up with those numbers? Banks will have people experience in many different industries. So if your assumptions are out of line with what they know the industry to experience, you could have a lot of explaining to do. I'm not saying it's impossible. Your track record, your prior history is going to be very valuable in this, but prepare to explain. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the more proof you can put behind it, like we're working with, I've worked with clients in the past that have had contracts lined up that, that say this vendor is going to spend this much money with us signed in agreement as soon as we open our doors. Very helpful. And so something like that, like that's like, no, there's really, there's something here. I'm not just manifesting this from my heart and dreams and wishes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I actually have prospective clients lined up, so that's helpful. One story that you had mentioned was how to earn 18% return on investment for this particular client. <laughs> I fell in love with this story immediately upon reading it. So all of the audience is going to be wondering, all right, Dave, how do you earn? This sounds like a myth. How okay. Do we... <laughs> it, it sounds like a myth. And that was the, I'll tell you about that. A business owner that I knew of uh, was, had had a slump and just came into a little over a quarter of a million dollars from the sale of a house, his house. And coincidentally, what he owed for credit card debt was about that same number. And as we were talking about about this, I could see he was kind of thinking about how do I invest that money? It's mine, and, and I'm going to be able to do something with it. 
So I, I suggested to him, how would you like to earn 18% per annum? And his reaction was, that's great. But then a dark shadow came over his face like, what the hell are you selling me? Pardon my French. Uh, what's, your, what's your idea? So I said, why don't you pay off your credit card bills? That way, you're gonna, that money is as good as earning you 18% because that's the rate you're paying for your credit card bills. So the lesson that he learned is that the opportunities or the likelihood that your credit card rate of interest is going to go down, it's remote. The likelihood that you're going to get a really good investment opportunity that will pay off more than a credit card rate is remote. And the likelihood that you're going to make an investment that years down the road is going to grow and pay off more than the credit card rates, it's possible, but it ain't likely to happen to, to a lot of us. So don't count on it. And I, I say to people, make money at what you do best. Use an investment advisor. <laughs> Use an investment advisor to invest your money to the extent that you can afford to invest without taking on more risk. And uh, probably you're going to ask me about this later, but you do want to leave your money in your business to handle reserves that are, you need for a rainy day. So keep in mind that when you, we invest our money in the stock market, that has risks. We can't think that it doesn't. And once you put it into the market, you lose the ability to, to really have a stable reserve of money. You have an unstable reserve is the best way I can describe it. Sometimes it's down, but will it be what you need when you need it? So I tell people, have a rainy day fund. It could be for an emergency repair. It could be for opening a line, a, a new product line or something like that. It could be for when you hit a slump and, and you need just to be able to, to have money available. How much should that reserve be? Can't really tell. It's not a science, and your ability to have exactly what you need may not be there. But think about what you're concerned about, your risk, whatever you think is at risk, and build towards it. And so an example, if your risk is that you think over the next three months there might be a slowdown in collecting your receivables or, or getting your bills out for whatever reason, think about what are the operating expenses you need to carry for a three-month period. Try do your best to build towards that so that you can carry that amount. So looking at building up a three-month reservoir of, of what you would owe during a period of time and having that as cash reserves yeah. um, is, is a rule of thumb. But obviously, like you said, it's, it's a dynamic situation. It depends on your business. You need to understand yeah. your operations. It's easy for me to say rule of thumb. And when I say to you, have three-month reserves for a particular reason, maybe it's hard to do. But how close can you get to that? Try. Right. right. Don't give. Up, don't throw up your hands. Just try and, and be there. Yeah, because a lot of people lean on uh, lines of credit in situations like that, which is which is doable. But then you're then you're relying on debt to pull you out of the situation. Right. So you're relying on future earnings. Essentially, is what's happening in that case. Yes. So rather than saving and preparing for these times, you're hoping that post an issue that arises post the slowdown that you're going to be able to pick back up and then earn that money to pay back. Yes. Yeah. That makes sense. And that, so that goes into an interesting conversation about debt. I know that you've talked about debt being uh, like a, a restrictor, a constraint on businesses. Um, could you dive into yeah. a little bit of that? Okay. Now you've brought a bank into your life. The banks will ask for collateral of some kind. Sometimes they also put, terms into a loan that are reasonable, but the business owner has to appreciate it. And these things are kind of what I would call restrictive covenants. They may ask you to have a minimum tangible net worth, minimum amount of working capital, debt to equity ratio is something they look at. They might even say before you make a distribution to an owner that you get our approval. So I would consider that a constraint that you have to live with. Certainly, banks are flexible in the sense that they understand that if you own a pass-through entity, 
and they understand that the owners are going to pay the income tax out of profits, they can, it can be explained to the owner that, hey, I am going to absorb a tax obligation because of the income that I have from the business, and I need to be able to make a minimum distribution just to cover my taxes. That's something that can dealt, be dealt with. But in general, taking on debt costs money and constrains a business afterwards. Right. You know, it's often that you need you need that infusion of capital to be able to to start the business, to grow the business, to to add that second building, to add to open up the second location of your restaurant to get going. But that goes into the financial planning on the front end. Yeah. To understand what's the demand, you know, the whole, it's basically renewing your business plan. And making sure that you're preparing for all of these things, you're anticipating the kind of foot traffic or for whatever kind of business it is. Or, you know, there should be a justification for the expansion that is justified and edified through the numbers. Yeah. And also think about the kind of debt that you want in those situations. So if you're going to infuse your – start off your business or kick off a new store with new inventory or build up with new receivables – you probably should be thinking about short-term debt or lines of credit. If you're thinking about brick and mortar and things like that, the best idea might be to take a look at long-term debt. So it, it's good to have a strategy for what kind of debt is best for you. And the reason I say these things is because if it's to finance receivables or inventory, it's going to turn over. It should be turning over quickly. And so lower interest rate will come with short-term debt. Mm. We like that yes. if, we have to, if we have to borrow it all. For things like brick and mortar, long-term investment, uh, hard costs, you may need to consider long-term debt. It's, it's going to be a big layout of money initially, so you may not be able to recover that and pay back the bank initially. Uh, so having a, a longer-term debt, may involve higher interest rates, but it may be the best way to go. Mm -hmm. It's something to, something to consider and to understand the implications that come with the different types of debt, specifically the, the interest rates associated right. and what you actually need versus what you want. A lot of people want to start at the five-star restaurant level, and it's like, well, what if we started smaller? What if we started more simple? Yeah. You know, and then we can grow into it. Yeah. So that's, you know. It's it's there's considerations to make there. Are there any truths about cash? I know that we had talked about this uh, that we haven't touched uh, base on yet that you would like to share. I do like to talk about that. Yeah, a couple of pointers. One, the truth is we cannot pay salaries with receivables, and so some very successful businesses are run by, uh, let's say, managing partners who will say to you, things are very simple around here. We are a cash business. You don't think about it that way, but that's why we have to think about that. The same thing with inventory. We cannot pay salaries with inventory. In an ideal world, we would like to have the right amount of inventory. If we have too little, if we, if we really are tight on our purchases, we run the risk of a stock out, meaning that we may not be able to produce or our customers may walk away to the store next door and buy what they need because the other guy had the inventory on hand. We don't want to overinvest in inventory. You do that and you could have that, that widget or that, that material that you wanted that's five years' worth of sales. Well, great, but what are you going to do after six months when it's still taking up floor space and you got to work around it and it spoils, and or whatever else is going on. So you got to be careful. For a small and medium-sized business, getting the right amount of inventory and purchases is an art. For the Fortune 500 or the, the largest organizations, it's nice. They have armies of people who are figuring this down to the pound, but we don't have that, that generous <laughs> luxury. Right. Yeah, no, you have to start somewhere. And so... You know, and for like you said, each business is independent, individual, and unique. And so you're, but there are trends within industry that you can look into to understand and see models of what already exists. Like they say, there's nothing new under the sun. And so there's people out there that have developed systems and things like that that you can do the research again, knowing what you don't know. 
and then going out to pursue that knowledge. Think of the challenges, though. Let's say you're, you're in an industry like the fashion industry. For the fashion industry, if you pick the wrong trend, after one season, you're dead. Yeah, and if you overinvest, that, that's the first thing that I thought of when yeah. you mentioned the five-year, getting five years of inventory. If that goes out of style, if that goes out of preference, if new models or whatever, if it's whether it's a computer you're building or, or clothes or whatever the case may be, is that going to be as relevant in five years as it is right now? Maybe it's the hot trending thing right now, but you have to know your industry to know that, oh, okay, well, these waves come and go in nine-month periods or in 15-month periods. And so that needs to be a part of that kind of planning. And and another thing that you, you might think about in trends is, is, I guess you might think of it as the obvious, but let's look at technology. You may want to build your products so that they really don't last that long, like maybe three to five years. And I, I'm not a technology expert, but you may say to yourself, what's the point of making the perfect widget if a new technology is going to come around and just make me totally obsolete? So if I make it so that there'll be time for another rejuvenation, another another lifetime of my product in a different way, maybe I can economize on on the important parts that go into this so that we'll be ready to take on new challenges when out of necessity new ideas are needed. Right. It'd be like as if Apple were to take the iPhone and say, we're going to make the iPhone that's going to last your whole life. And all that it's going to need is software updates, but it's going to be so durable and we'll be able to make any repairs to it. And all the updates are just going to happen via software. And that's ignoring the human pattern, the human behavior behind it, where we want new things. We want the newest. We don't want, we don't feel like it's, we have something new when we get a software update. We feel like it's new when the new iPhone comes out and I say this also as an Android user proudly, um, <laughs> but the uh, but regardless of the phone type, you know you're waiting for that that new component of it, which most of the time isn't really that dramatic of a change from one phone to the next. But it's the new one, it's the number, it's the next generation. Well, that's how some businesses also design their competition uh, or their competitive posture. And what I mean by that is some businesses can manufacture a new item and they may they will try and keep it slim, lean to capture market share, knowing that as other competitors jump into that area, they can then put on accessories that are very valuable and still differentiate themselves right. in the market. So there, there can be a whole strategy to this. Absolutely. It's important. So – the last thing that I want to touch on before I, I try to pull out some tips for businesses uh, that I can get from you when it comes to the financial side of things. A lot of people might confuse their savings and their emergency funds and everything with things like we talked about the line of credit, but also insurance. Mm. And so how how do you view insurance in this in this kind of situation? Is it is it a how does it fit into this? What a good question. Insurance is all about managing your risks. Some people take the point of view that if I have insurance, I don't need a reserve fund for emergency repairs. And the problem with that is that it takes time to process an insurance claim. Secondly, when you do collect on your insurance claim, it may not be all the money that you really need. Depending on how your policy reads, it may be that you'll get enough money for replacement cost. Or, or, or getting uh, the equivalent of a used widget or used structure. But in my mind, this is just me personally, when it comes to getting that structure replaced that's as good as the one you had, I, don't ex I think that's the way it ought to be. The insurance company may not. The whole depreciation of value. Oh, I think my mind immediately goes to cars. Yeah, that's you know, it's like exactly if you, if you, what I'm implying. Yeah, if you wreck your car, you're not going to get the full value, top notch. Right. As, you know, it's gonna. There's going to be a depreciated value that they assign right. to it, where you're not going to get the full value. Right. So there are limitations on what you can expect from insurance. I'm thinking about the tragedy in um, in Florida where a condominium unit collapsed, right. 
and the members of that of that condominium unit never built up a reserve. They did have an insurance fund, but sadly, that didn't do the job and, and didn't even uh, protect people in the event of necessary use of the funds. It's not something to to take place of your actual savings and reserve to make sure that you remain operational. Not at all. That's, that's the, that's the focus. I think the kind of takeaway that I took from this is you have to think about putting the focus on how do you earn money? And so, and what's going to stop that from happening and what's going to mitigate the risk when, when something breaks down, because if you have machines, if you have a factory that's producing the widgets and something breaks down, a part of your machinery breaks down, yeah, you have insurance. You're not going to have to come out of pocket for a lot of this. But to your point, what happens in the meantime? How mm-hmm. long does it take us to get from that machine's broken, going through the insurance process, finally getting the claim, not getting enough money to be able to replace it with a new piece of equipment? It just comes with its own set of headaches and processes that what you have to challenge. go through. Yeah. yeah. What a challenge. A hundred percent. All right. So – I'm going to try to pull out some some little tidbits of wisdom from you. I know that you've been doing that throughout this whole conversation, and I'm so thankful for that. So if we're thinking about a new business, somebody that's just starting out in business, what would be your top two or three pieces of advice or tips for them when it comes to the financial planning and management of their business? There is a startup period. How long is that startup period? Until the, we get a handle – we'll be spending more money than we collect. So the first thing you'd want to try and estimate is how long does it take us to break even? And give yourself an honest answer, an honest estimate. And I have no rule of thumb. This is one of those examples where you need to learn what you don't know. And to tell you the truth, you're going to have to learn what's impossible to know. I'm sorry to say. If you can do that, you will at least have goals, put yourself in a, in a mindset of saying, in order to accomplish this, I need to have certain goals. I need to have started yesterday. In that, and by that, I mean there's a marketing cycle, there's a production cycle, and there's, there's actually a cycle that uh, we call the cash cycle where if you want to take the time it takes to produce something and the time it takes to collect the money that we get from our sales, that's how long it takes us to produce the cash that runs our business. Insert the financing and, and see what's going to happen. It's a long-winded way of saying we got to know how long this is going to take to get going. From there, all the questions come. Marketing, having the right people in place, having the right venue, the location in place. So many things come from there. I call that the it's, – it's the 10 question, the 10 answer question. We – you, there are so many things to think about once you say, what does it take for me to break even? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And understanding that cycle is super important and the, the length of time it takes for you to get even just to complete one sales cycle, like with one customer and, and being able to kind of plan for that by doing, we, I often talk about reverse engineering the customer experience. Mm-hmm. So going from you're delivering them a bouquet of flowers, thanking them for their the business that they've done with you and wishing them the best of luck in their future endeavors if they're moving on all the way backwards to they have no idea who you are and how do they become aware of you. Mm-hmm. And so by going through that and, and going into this kind of how-why breakdown of each step along the way is something that I've seen to be very valuable that can help people to get a very, a much better understanding of the length of time that it takes to get there, or at least a template for them to go through where then they can look at these different pieces of that customer journey. And as they're going through that, they can start to take notes like, okay, in order to get these people aware, it takes about this many weeks of marketing and advertising. Once they get in, it takes, you know, another week, two weeks to close the deal and then to complete the production or whatever, the the follow through, um, the deliverables, that takes X amount of time. It's going to hit you like a ton of bricks. There are so many assumptions that you've got to uh, convert into best, as reasonable as possible, your best guesses. And that's how you're going to be challenged when you step up and ask people to back you up. Absolutely. So if a, if a company is experiencing financial turbulence, maybe they were anticipating that the year was going to go great and it's not going so well, 
what is the what's the first thing that they should look at in inside of their budget or any of any of their financial materials and resources that they have? We don't want to learn about this on December thirtieth. So we need to look at financial statements with comparisons to expectations at least monthly. And we need to see where the numbers are falling off. For the seasonal business, the challenge is if we've missed a season, it's going to take us quite a while to come back and bounce back. So with our knowledge of what we should expect in terms of the earliest indicators of success – or failure. We want to look at the best things we can to, to get the knowledge we need. One of the things that people want to look for in the beginning is not the dollars, but the key performance indicators. I love to, to point this out, but if you look at any one of Tesla's press releases, the first day after every quarter, I should say, he's always talking about how many cars did we manufacture and how many cars did we sell. Right away, you've got an indicator of how well you're doing before the monthly results are put together and the investors are going wild just because of the car numbers or they're beating him up because of the car (laughs) numbers. You really want to get your, your information as early as possible so that you can adapt. That makes sense. Are there any other pieces of pieces of advice or recommendations that you can make to small or medium sized business owners when it comes to fi- uh, financial preparedness or any any other tips or pieces of wisdom that you could bestow upon us? Thank you. Two things. One is keep it simple. And it, w- when somebody explains to me how their business operates and it's very complicated, I feel like something is not right. I like the idea that we keep it simple. And I call the second idea, along with keeping it simple, is we know that all business models have a primary objective, buy low and sell high. That's the magic. And we need to make that happen. If it gets beyond that, got to ask what, what's really going on here. That makes sense. Dave, I can't thank you enough for spending the time with us, for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with the audience. If people want to get a hold of you, learn more about what you have going on, what are, what are their kind of best ways to do so? That's great. My email address, dave.groomer at gmail.com. That's simple enough. <laughs> yeah, that's simple. Uh, there will be a web page in, in months to come, but right now I'm just building. Perfect. So that's that. An emergency call or, or a call just to bat around ideas is welcome. 646-522-1074. We can talk uh, short conversation just to, informally, just to bat around some ideas. We have a global audience. And so if you get some interesting phone numbers coming your way, don't be terribly surprised. <laughs> interesting uh, much love to you guys and and there was a particular oh sarah can you go into one of the recent podcasts that were published with lauren i think it was when we were going through the certifications there was a comment in there from somebody and i want i want to point them out by their username on there to thank them because they asked the question which was about introducing the guests and the people that we speak to and it was something that I hadn't done as much with the internal SBDC advisors and the people that work here because we've had them on so many times. <clears throat> but it was such a brilliant point because I didn't take into consideration the fact that new people are coming in all the time. And I believe that this gentleman is from India and he has a, a team of people that are out there with him that have participated in some SBDC training events and things like that. I believe so it should be in the government contracts and in the uh, the certifications, I believe, episode. That's great. I, I'll tell you something. There are a lot of talented people out in India. And uh, it's, it's amazing the, uh, the work that's been outsourced from this country out to India because they have a very, very smart bunch of people 100%. in their workforce. A hundred percent. Yeah, I'm seeing it across, across the world. One of the things that I – from what I've my understanding of the global business kind of like trending nations and things like that, that are starting to come up all of those, many of those that are, that are in their ascent right now, I'm seeing a, a, a growth in our show 
of viewership from these countries, like That's great. the Philippines, from Indonesia, from India, from all over the world of these places that are looking, I think, to better understand the the business community and how to operate and things like that. So we're, we're honored and humbled to be able to serve such a wide community. You know, this podcast was, was designed for, you know, it's the name of its business breakthrough New York, Yeah. you know? And so it wasn't even necessarily specifically sought out for the entire nation, but rapidly we saw that it was adopted from California to Texas to obviously New York up and down the East coast. And then we saw this growth globally and we're like, it's just, it's humbling. Did yeah. you find it? What's the gentleman's uh, username? I believe it was a man. Now I feel really bad if it was a woman. I'm... So, oh, can I hear myself? So this is Madi Banners. And it says, how come you don't introduce your guests to us? Who are they? What are their names? And what do they do? Or is that a business secret? Ooh, yes. Ooh. Yes. See, I like it. I like it. Especially because it was a question that was it was valid and it was something we should should have been more conscientious about. And so Madi, you said Madi banners. Thank you, Madi. We appreciate you. I hope that you're watching this one because this is a shout out for you. And, uh, and hopefully the introduction for this episode and the previous ones, since you've made that comment have been up to your standard <laughs> and, and we truly appreciate you and, and everyone else that's, that's watching. And again, thank you, Dave. And Matthew, I want to thank you and Sarah for this, this really nice opportunity to speak to people all over the place.